I've been um, relying on slides for so long. Why something came from graduate school. It's such a nice crutch. You get them all prepared and you talk from the slides. So I decided a few days ago, boy, if I'm going to do this, I'm doing this different this time. I'm going to loosen up a little bit. Um, as many of you know, I'm John Navasio. I was trained as a classical plant breeder. I was um, in the program right before there was hardly any, uh, any people doing projects with uh, GM, kind of the last of that wave, though now we have a whole young group of plant breeders learning plant breeding without uh, using GM. Thank goodness. It's wonderful to see. Some of them hopefully are here. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the heart of biology uh, in this whole debate, because I think we need to take it back to the heart of what we're really doing here with this unbroken chain of the coevolution of the crop plants that we, that we use and our farming systems, which Matthew so eloquently talked about last night and that I think everyone knows in this room to the core of our being as part of this whole deal. These are the, the crop plants we use are in fact our, our lifeblood. And in fact, we all know that anyone who's observant, that they're changing with us, whether we like it or not. And the more that we partake in that and do the selection and adaptation, the more it becomes um, truly the best they can be for, for our needs. Uh, we know that's what we're talking about in so many sessions here. It's essentially plant breeding that all farmers who grow seeds do. So, um, I would say that first and foremost, my plea is that this, what I call cell-mediated uh, cytoplasmic male sterility, which is a mouthful, so cell-mediated CMS, we've talked about CMS forever, and Jim gave a nice overview, but this cytoplasmic male sterility that has been in agriculture for almost 100 years now, um, when it is done using cell fusion, is a biological dead end. So let me give my arguments here for a second and I'll explain that. So um, very close to 100 years ago now, 90 years ago, uh, Henry Jones in uh, Davis, California found an onion in his breeding patch that didn't produce flowers. Or I guess it would produce flower. It produced, it was an onion that produced both bow bills like a garlic as well as some flowers. And the flowers were sterile. Uh, but in fact, he could keep reproducing this onion. It was an Italian red torpedo onion, actually. And that he could keep reproducing it, just planting the bulb bills, similar to what you could do in garlic. And he realized upon further investigation, even pre-modern molecular techniques, that in fact it was truly sterile. And uh, with some deeper research, they realized it came from the uh, aberrant uh, mitochondrial DNA. So as Jim showed you in those nice slides, the uh, oftentimes in the traditional cytoplasmic male sterility that we've used for close to 100 years, there will be defects in the mitochondria. And in fact, that's the organelle that they're moving around from cell to cell. It's not nuclear DNA. Did everybody kind of get that from that? Those wonderful slides. It's getting that organelle called the mitochondria, which is inherited through the female side. Uh, so once uh, Henry Jones published on this and they started, the, the first hybrid uh, vegetable crop was onions, in fact, by, I believe it was the early 30s. Um, and then corn, they found CMS in corn, and uh, that led to a whole revolution in, in corn because you didn't have to detassel anymore, so they got into problems there. That's beyond the scope of this, but perhaps I'll touch on that at, in concluding remarks. Um, and then uh, Henry Munger, who there's at least a couple people in this room who knew Dr., the late Dr. Munger, uh, was on vacation on Cape Cod in the early 50s. And, and while picking berries in his mother-in-law's backyard, found a carrot that looked sterile, that he could tell. Again, uh, opportunity is for the prepared mind. There's a great quote on that, and I can't remember it now. 
uh, favors the prepared mind. So Dr. Jo uh, Dr. Munger saw this and took his handkerchief and tied it around the plant and asked his mother-in-law to send him the seeds at the end of the season. And in fact, that led to all of the modern uh, carrot uh, cytoplasmic male sterility came from that wild carrot, that Queen Anne's lace plant in his mother-in-law's backyard. Um, the point being here with all of this is we have been using CMS naturally um, and Jim, that's what you called allia, alloplastic CMS. That was a new one for me. Cytoplasmic male sterility has been used for over 50 years in carrots, onions, beets, and corn. Those are the four I know. And, and two of those I've worked with extensively. When you use the, here's the real point of my philosophy. When you use that naturally occurring CMS, there are often these, and Jim showed it with his big M, little m, there are often these uh, restoration genes that restore fertility, or M for maintainer. I won't get into the technicality. But it restores the fertility in the F1 hybrid. You can maintain a female that's sterile, which works really great for hybrid seed production. And OSA, by the way, has never been philosophically anti-hybrids or any of that. We, we love OPs because they're very easy to work with. They're more plastic, easier to change. But using naturally occurring uh, biological systems to create hybrids, in this case, with the naturally occurring, which I'm now going to start calling naturally occurring CMS because we're forced to. That's another point here. But using that good old school wild uh, CMS sterility from from defective mitochondria has worked splendidly. And the, the best thing about it, here's my plea, is that in almost all cases, when you're using multiple parents in the hybrid, there is some restoration of that fertility in the F1 hybrid. Hence, we have people in this room who have taken things like Copra onion and made Clear Dawn onion, which is we're going to put in our trial this year, our onion trial. And in fact, the point was made yesterday by someone, and I was racking my brain this morning trying to remember who, but somebody said, what we've always done in plant breeding in the 20th century, in our short modern plant breeding since, since 1900, has, has been, we generally do not go back to the oldest heirlooms, et cetera. We find each other's best stuff that's got the best current uh, genetic background to do and the, the traits that are rough and ready for our conditions now. And we breed from each other's material. No good plant breeder tries to start completely from scratch. Even if we use older germplasm, as Michael Mazurk was talking about yesterday, going to secondary uh, uh, centers of origin, what we're doing is we're taking some of that and putting it into the newest stuff. So the thing that has been completely a dead end in plant breeding, a very, a very serious hindrance to good plant breeding in the past 15 or 20 years has been the fact that with all of this kind of fancy technology, there's always a patent behind it. And the patent behind it, then it's dead end. I can't use it. I'm going to get sued by some Philadelphia lawyer from Monsanto. And so at that point, there is the plant breeding dead end. The other thing that's a dead end is, as I just described, and I hope this isn't over everybody's head, but you know, with that old CMS, there are always those restorer genes, and we have fertility, and we can breed from them. With the cell-mediated cell fusion, the reason the companies love this so much is because there is absolutely no pollen. You're inheriting that mitochondrial DNA, in this case in brassicas from radish, that cannot be restored in this foreign background of a cauliflower or a broccoli. So there is absolutely no pollen I can't save seeds from the hooker eye turnip, which, by the way, we believe is a 
uh, CMS mediated, uh, uh, cell mediated cell. You see, I can't even get it straight. Cell mediated CMS. And so all of a sudden we have this hooker eye turnip that all my growers are saying, man, we want an OP version of that. It's a dead end, baby. I can't, I can't get seeds out of that. And so always look below the surface on this too. This is, this is the ultimate in patent protection for me being able to breed with, um, with their material. So if the history of human beings, domesticated plants, all of our ancestors down to today and this wonderful group of people, we heard Matthew rallying the troops last night about, you know, it's up to us to be the seed savers. And this, this stops it all dead in the tracks. What are we all going to just go back to heirlooms, et cetera? It's wonderful. And I use heirlooms in my breeding, but I also want the, I'm using some, I made sure they weren't patented, some very recently released Dutch spinaches in my current breeding program. And I can't, I can't function as a plant breeder uh, if this sort of thing goes through. When I first heard about this 20 years ago when I worked for the Alf Christensen Seed Company, Alf Christensen was going gaga because they wanted to make all of, they'd had hybrid cabbages uh, using the, uh, the other technique that Jim mentioned that's be way beyond the scope of this talk, uh, using self-incompatibility for years. And all of a sudden, the Japanese, the, uh, the Japanese company that owned Alf Christensen Seed Company, who I worked for in the Skagit Valley, uh, they had this, this new CMS that they wanted to put into all of their cabbage. But this process was our little million-dollar research facility in Mount Vernon was no way we could handle the high-tech you know, you had to have sterile facilities. It was it was all used tissue culture. You had to tissue culture out all of the potential female lines. You had to reproduce thousands of them. It was totally the big bucks deal. It was, if you're not one of the big of the big, you ain't going to do this. So it's one more of the things that makes this so high tech that we're never going to have more than four or five players really doing it. And again, this is the part of the concentration issue. Even if I want to breed, I, with the, with the, with the older form of hybrid uh, use of um, self-incompatibility, I, even on my limited budget, if I really want to take a lot of my time, which I don't have, I could be breeding hybrid cabbage. It, it can be done. Jim is doing it on a much less budget than than uh, than one of the big companies at OSU. But to get into this whole game, this is, it's a rich man's game. And I think the other thing that we have to remember is we want seeds for the people. We want seeds for every small seed companies, several of which in this room, you know who they are. Their catalogs are all out in the hallway. We want everybody to get into this game. We don't want this to be a high tech, only the, only the big boys uh, do it. So um, I guess I'll just close on my plea is for biology and evolution. We have to keep uh, having all of this germplasm accessible to all of us to keep using, to keep breeding from. And I haven't even touched on, and hopefully in the question and answer, uh, we'll get a distinguished guest in the audience, Edith Lemmertz Van Buren, who's written about this extensively for iPhone, about the integrity of the cell and that as being a distinguishing thing in the debate over, over um, whether we use this kind of technology or not. I hope that helps.